You know, the year 2011, um, I just want to thank you for your Taiwanese people came, uh, rushed to the affected area and then did a lot of help. Yeah, yes. yes. And and my there. my own uh, first and second dose of AstraZeneca, I also must thank you, uh, the people and government oh. of Japan, for generously donating those. Uh, I uh, was um, very grateful that my freedom of travel and so on uh, could be ensured thanks to this very kind uh, gesture. Oh, that's, that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. So you got a second shot already? No, third shot now. Oh, you said uh, Yeah, my oh, booster okay. was uh, Medigen. It's a uh, Taiwan local um, product, uh, but the first two were AstraZeneca. Okay, okay. So you're all set. Mm hmm You could travel. Yes, looking um, forward to come to Japan. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, please. Can't mm -hmm. wait. Um, I, I don't know if, if I told you that, but um, I... I wrote a book last year, mm -hmm. and this is called the Digital Fascism, mm -hmm. and um, I, I, it was like a wake-up call for Japanese people mm -hmm. to remember what's the really meaning of uh, democracy mm -hmm. um, before the the corporate power um, takes it over um, the the social sector and everything. Mm -hmm. So. Um, your concept of uh, digital democracy was huge inspiration for me and for everyone in the world to to find a um, new way to um, forward with a digital democracy and, and a digital um, uh, technology. Mm -hmm. So. And first of all, uh, what I want to ask is that um, during pandemic, um, how were uh, civil liberty um, in Taiwan maintained with the, uh, you know, um, tracing, contact tracing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, collecting all the people's data and everything? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, how could you maintain that mm -hmm. the freedom? Um, so I will say first, that Taiwan did not enter a state of emergency in the past couple years. Oh. So whatever measures we take must be pre-approved, including the regulatory and budgetary approval by the parliament. Uh, concretely mm -hmm. speaking, it means that uh, what we are doing must be pre-existing. Uh, before the pandemic. We use technologies that already exist before the pandemic. We prefer those because they are more easily understandable and explainable, but also because the cybersecurity and privacy parameters are easier to reason about if you have a system that has been going on for a decade or two decades. It's much more easy okay. to analyze than something that's just invented during the pandemic. That's my first point. The second point mm -hmm. is that we use privacy enhancing technologies. You mentioned contact tracing. Uh, for example, we introduce a SMS based contract tracing method where a person can choose to, it's not mandatory, they can still write on paper, uh, they can choose to scan the QR code but with no app download, uh, just with their mobile phones built in camera and send a SMS of 15 random digits corresponding to the venue to the 1922, which is a toll-free number. And what it does is that the venue learns nothing about this customer because the customer's own phone is sending to their own telecom operator and this data is not shared with the venue owner. On the other hand, the mobile phone carrier uh, while they do know the phone number, of course, because they issued a SIM card in first place, they do not transmit that data anywhere. And they know nothing about the venue because the 15-digit <coughs> random code is only known <coughs> to the customer and the venue, but not the telecom operator. So through this multi-party arrangement, nobody has the complete piece of puzzle, so to speak, and the government never receive the data until 
someone gets infected and we have to do contact tracing, in which time only the authenticated contact tracer get to piece together the data and their contact tracing effort are themselves recorded so that anyone with their phone can check in on a website sms.1922.gov.tw that which municipalities, which contact tracer have accessed their record uh, in the past 28 days. Of course, after 28 days, all the records are deleted. And so there's wow. mutual accountability, there's decentralized storage, there's privacy enhancing technologies built upon the ideas of QR code and SMS, which all existed for decades before the pandemic and therefore easy to reason and uh, to adapt. So if my phone doesn't have a camera, I can also manually text the 15 digits in. Again, very transparent in what the technology is doing. Wow. So there's a two-way accountability. Um, that, that's pretty new to uh, many cities, I guess, because mm -hmm. usually the, uh, the only one way, right, the state can see you, mm -hmm. but the citizen cannot see mm -hmm. um, how and when their data was accessed and used, right? And that, that created a lot of problems. Um, so the two-way accountability, did it exist before COVID-19? Yes. It, Yes, uh, we have the national health care system, which was digitalized with uh, IC cards, similar to your uh, My Number cards, around 2003. By 2004, <coughs> you, the electronic records are already uh, digitalized, and we made sure that whenever a pharmacist, a clinician, or a nurse, or so on, um, have to access your IC card, they have their own IC card uh, and the institution's IC card. So that's three cards. Um, and so all transactions are recorded in a uh, record. So anyone can go back and see what the other two cards are when their own card enters a transaction. Again, this enabled me to uh, use my phone using the National Healthcare Insurance Express app to look at all the diagnosis, all the prescriptions and so on. And if there's errors and so on, uh, I get to know and correct them in the national health care insurance. So that idea has been around since at least 2003, 2004, and by say 2014, 2015, it's already part of daily life that people would check their mobile phone for a two-way accountability when it comes to national health matters. Wow. So um, since it's all transparent mm -hmm. and um, always you could trace uh, where your data goes and who access to it and when, so that makes people um, trust the government, right, about the, mm. how they use the data. I think uh, it means the government trusts the people, right? <laughs> to hold us accountable. Um, the people may or may not trust the government. Maybe they look at the record uh, of SMS.1922 and decide that they trust the venue owner more than they trust the telecom. And that's their choice. We're not forcing anyone. Uh, or they say um, they already have this stamp uh, the seal, uh, like people in Japan, right? Many yeah. people have a uh, seal with their name on it, and there's an uh, advanced uh, version of the seal that carries its own ink, so you don't have to uh, carry an ink pad around, right? So uh, some people prefer that they just put their uh, family name uh, and the contact number on this self-refilling seal, uh, and they just want to stamp their way in into venues. They say it's quicker than scanning a QR code. They're probably right. It takes half a second to stamp uh, right. and takes maybe two seconds to scan a QR code. And we're not forcing people uh, who believe in uh, ink uh, and seal technology to switch uh, to digital technology. Oh, so you're actually giving a choice, mm -hmm. let's say for elderly people, mm -hmm. you know, maybe not everyone mm -hmm. is, wants to do a digital right away. Mm -hmm. and some people, are, you know, prefer analog, right? Mm -hmm. We have the same situation in Japan, mm -hmm. but uh, as, as long as you give a choice to them, mm -hmm. then th that's up to them. 
Yes, uh, and we uh, strongly believe if we do not have an alternate choice, then the digital would be, I wouldn't say fascist, but authoritarian. It will be forcing people to adapt to digital technology instead of assisting people to lower their risk and save their time with digital technology. So it wouldn't be assistive, it would be authoritarian. And we always want to focus on the assistive part. Well, that, that's, that's wonderful, because I remember that um um, I was in New York City mm -hmm. at the, when the 9-11 happened mm -hmm. and right after 9-11 it was like because of an emergency situation mm -hmm. it was like that uh, gives some power to the government to do anything over <coughs> a constitution mm -hmm. or current law mm -hmm. and what, what I was um, what I was very impressed by your story is that um, Taiwanese government didn't use that i mean you you guys did it within the framework mm -hmm. of the yes and the law, right mm -hmm. yes uh, we've never done uh, like the president's order that takes effect and later the parliament approves it. We've not done that in the past couple years. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is that we strongly believe that uh, the people need to be part of the equation in countering the pandemic. If people just follow orders without understanding the scientific reason why and so on, it creates a fatigue and distrust very quickly, which may be effective on the short run, but when the pandemic goes on and on, it's actually uh, a strong drawback because people get tired following things they don't understand. Right, right. That that's exactly what's been happening in the U.S. and in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a strong demonstration um, anti those um, mm -hmm. rules, mm -hmm. mandatory mm -hmm. rules. Mm -hmm. Both Europe and America, it's it, it's it's unbelievable. And um, so, speaking of uh, uh, transparency of information. Um, I had a Taiwan a citizen participate in pre-election debates and do fact-checking mm -hmm. yes. in real time by themselves, right? Yes, that's correct, even middle Can schoolers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, of course. So um, fact-checking is part of the media competence curriculum in Taiwan, and we want the students to learn not just be the consumer of media information, uh, which is the literacy part, but rather contributor to the media landscape, which is the competence part. Right? Uh, literacy is when you read, uh, and competence is when you write. Right? So the, right. the, the main uh, difference here is that the newsroom must be seen uh, as early as primary or middle school uh, to be something that everyone can contribute to. So we have a lot of civic fact-checking mechanisms built by the social sector, not by the government. The government just amplify those spaces for participation. So think Wikipedia, but uh, in real time. So uh, people know, for example, there's the co-facts for collaborative fact-checking uh, group. Uh, it's a G0V or Gov0 initiatives project where people can report on their line, uh, instant messenger, uh, the trending rumors, uh, which may or may not be true. Uh, but instead of just the press fact-checking them, it's everyday citizens, including students, they can provide fact-checking material and they can help identify the ones that are getting the most viral with a highest R value, so to speak. Uh, and then the professional fact-checker take their contributions and write their professional fact-checking reports, which ends up, um, you know, like the spam detection uh, puts the incoming email to the junk mail folder, not the inbox. Uh, the fact-checking by, say, the Taiwan Fact-Checking Center results in not taking anything down, but a prominent notice that this has been fact-checked as disputed, uh, and also this label uh, that um, advises people to think twice uh, before sharing it more. So lowering uh, is our value. We call it notice and public notice. And the notice part is, of course, contributed by everyone, all the citizens, and it works in real time too during the presidential forum and debate. 
Wow, that that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, um, is it possible to use COPAC to steer people in a certain direction for like political purpose or any um, anything for mm -hmm. their own purpose? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it possible for anybody can get in and do that? Um, there is a community uh, standard. It's just like Wikipedia, uh, where all the source materials are evaluated and posted. Uh, but if it's about personal political opinion or feelings and so on, that is not the part of the COVAX uh, purview. So what people can do is just adding more pieces to the puzzle. Uh, but it's designed so you cannot take away things uh, from the collaborative facts around any particular item so uh, I think it's all part of the design of the space if you make it very easy uh, to for example um, do personal attacks and so on then of course those space could be polarized and toxic but if you design a space so that people just contribute material but with no way uh, to follow someone or to reply to a threaded conversation and things like that then it become uh, very difficult for trolls to take control. Right, right. Wow, that's great because, um, you know, like for example, in the US, the bias of fact checking by major high tech companies mm -hmm. became an issue mm -hmm. in the Congress mm -hmm. and um, they sued the company, and that's a big issue. And in Japan, um, for example, voices that differ from the government or WHO policy, um, uh, a lot of times often labeled as conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. So uh, people, citizens are um, kind of afraid of uh, posting their opinion mm -hmm. because they're, they're very worried about being judged. Um, but um, Compact is an all citizen based and it's like a Wikipedia, right? Right. It's uh, loosely modeled after Wikipedia, but focusing on fact checking. Mm. That, that's great. That's um, great. What, what about the, how, how do you deal with the social media? Because, uh, you know, social media services have a virtual monopoly, you know, on news. They can, if they want it, they could silence the opinion or uh, on certain individuals without anyone noticing these days um, like uh, they wanted if they wanted to take a certain opinion or uh, mm, so that can be done about the biz you know that that's on the business model like for example my uh -huh. twitter uh -huh. sometimes even if i post it uh -huh. and it's nobody could see it uh -huh, without uh -huh. me knowing right it's called shadow banning so so do you mean social media as a category or do you mean just twitter and facebook uh let's say twitter facebook like gaffer uh-huh yeah because it's uh, it's very different uh from our take of social media in in our um landscape uh people prefer to talk about political or uh public affairs on the social sectors version of social media oh. So, uh, for example, the PTT, which is entirely open source, is collaboratively governed. Uh, everything on PTT um, is not for profit purpose because it's a student pet project for more than 25 years now. Uh, and the uh, operation cost is mostly subsidized uh, by the uh, National um, Science and Technology Council uh, and so on. So basically, uh, the social media in Taiwan's sense means that uh, is a collaborative media maintained, operated by the social sector, by the volunteers. Uh, and so, um, of course, we still have people using Facebook for entertainment and posting cat pictures uh, and things like that. But we would not say that they have a monopoly 
uh, on the attention that people has, especially when it comes to public affairs, when people want to do petitioning, participatory budgeting, voting on presidential hackathon, they use the public infrastructure maintained by the government in the digital space. So the civic infrastructure like PTT and public infrastructure like the join platform, they also enjoy a lot of visits, uh, not uh, at all monopolized. <laughs> Uh, by the uh, GAFA. So I think that's a, a real difference uh, in the kind of investment in the public and civic infrastructures. And if you invest heavily in the civic and public infrastructures, uh, you won't face the dilemma of people wanting to hold a town hall conversation, but all they have as a choice is the nightclub in the entertainment sector with loud yeah. music, smoke, field room, private bouncer, addictive yeah. drinks, and advertisements, right? Uh, but uh, that's not, strictly speaking, the problem of the entertainment sector, right? I have uh, enormous respect for the <laughs> entertainment <laughs> sector uh, if uh, we don't invest in public parks, campus, and town halls. Right. So, so you're saying that it's not how you do that; it's where yes. you you exactly do that, right? yes, and, and also uh, if there is a choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, or, or even a district, right? Uh, people prefer to go to the campus when they want to learn things, the public library when they want to have a book club or something. Uh, but if all they have uh, is the this entertainment launch bar versus another dance club, uh, well, it's a, not really a choice when you only have the entertainment district. <laughs> that's true, and, and that's, that's very important that... Um, and uh, uh, we should invest more money on the public mm -hmm. spaces, right? Yes. Um, not just the digital, but all, you know, because mm -hmm. in Japan we are losing uh, public, um, many, many public places like mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, public library mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. public park, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. less and less space, public space where people um can speak freely mm -hmm. without worrying about without any worry of being hacked or being uh, attacked mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I, I think the peer pressure that you uh, mentioned, right? Uh, like the implicit uh, threat of being shadow banned, uh, right? Or being um, ignored or things like that. I think these uh, are kind of uh, the efforts that we put into designing a safe space is indeed to ensure that people are free from those worries. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That That's definitely something we can adapt in Japan, mm -hmm. I think. And um, it seems that civic hackers are very smart and quicker mm -hmm. to find, uh, provide public records and, and original data. You know, I'm, I'm an investigative journalist, and it takes time to get those original data usually. And and so nowadays, I think, oh, you know, civic hackers are much faster than me. So uh, what's my role now? Mm -hmm. in, you know. Digital era. What, mm -hmm. what do you think of the role of journalists? I think uh, journalism is uh, to the disinformation crisis. Uh, in the disinformation crisis, in the infodemic, journalism plays the same role as public health plays in epidemiology uh, situations mm -hmm. such as the pandemic. So journalism uh, as a practice like fact-checking and uh, aware of the framing effects, providing an angle, uh, following a story, offering a perspective, balancing the views, and so on. All these journalistic practices are like the, um, I don't know, hand washing and wearing mask and, and so on. Uh, it's, it's a mental hygiene, right? Because if one gets the journalistic practice in their natural habit, they would not be infected by the virus of the mind. Uh, that is the uh, conspiracy theories based on unfounded ideologies and things like that. So uh, instead of just a few people practicing journalism, protecting all other people, is the old gateway, uh, gatekeeper, right, theory. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, uh, it's impossible to gatekeep because everyone with a phone is their own media and we can't gatekeep yeah. them from themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
and as you mentioned, yeah. oh all the civic hackers, uh, citizen scientists, uh, armed with their uh, phone, they can just start live streaming on, on YouTube or something, uh, and then uh, they become their own broadcasting station. And <laughs> there's no gatekeeper, no editor, no fact checker to to help them, exactly. uh, right? So, so uh, I think um, our hope here is not so that uh, we take back their choice of platforms or take back uh, their mobile phone with live streaming capability. It's impossible, uh, just <laughs> as we don't do uh, lockdowns in Taiwan. But we do want to make sure as we remain free in our traveling, everyone understand the importance of washing their hands thoroughly, get vaccinated, uh, wearing masks and so on, which means journalism must become uh, a general practice for everyone with a live streaming account, you know, which is why the media competence, not just literacy, is in our basic education. So I believe journalism serves a very important role nowadays, but its hope is to get everyone becoming participators in journalism, civic journalism, so that all the civic hackers learns to use the force for the good side of the force, the light side of the force, not the dark side of the force, which <laughs> I'm sure I have more cookies, but <laughs> we want <laughs> to use the force for good. Right, right. Oh, well, that, that's very encouraging to me and all the journalists because, you know, um, these days, a lot of journalists have a dilemma that, oh, you know, in Japan, less and less people read a newspaper, mm -hmm. and um, or you know, like a paper thing, or even not even TV, and everybody's focusing on their own mm -hmm. smartphone. That's right. Yes. yes. So the mm -hmm. professional journalist, um, it's we are always under the pressure that we have to submit, we have to post our article, but there is a, so much competition there, and it has to be faster, mm -hmm. it has to be sensational, instead of, uh, you, you, don't, you don't have time, enough time to do the good investigative journalism, because everything is so fast, and replace a new, um, new thing every day, new subject every day, but I still believe that um, investigative Journalism mm -hmm. needs uh, yeah. it's necessary for, for society. Yeah, if you fund your work based on advertisements, then of course you need to work to the pace of advertisements, which, as right. you mentioned, is getting much faster, much more personal, uh, and also um, uh, much more relying on the impulse of a small screen. Because when people read on a small screen, they don't do long form because the screen doesn't encourage long form, right? right. So, so all these factors made uh, um, journalism difficult to practice if you only have uh, this very limited space to work in so to speak. But in Taiwan, uh, some of the best investigative journalism work are not funded by advertisement at all. They're funded uh, by crowdfunding, by subscription, uh, by uh, the uh, social sector, that is to say, people voluntarily donating money uh, in order to get better investigative journalism and so on. I believe that is uh, freeing the investigative journalist from uh, the tempo of the advertisers. And instead, if you look mm -hmm. at the investigative journalism awards in the past couple, uh, past few years in Taiwan, many of which went to the investigative journalist uh, belonging to not-for-profit um, efforts. And the not-for-profit efforts funded by the social sector is every bit um, as legitimate, I would say more legitimate than the state uh, mm -hmm. when it comes uh, to uh, what's actually happening and so on. So, uh, for example, I, I read and indeed contributed to uh, before uh, entering the cabinet, uh, the reporter, uh, and I'm just pasting the link to you and they do really good investigation work without any advertisement and all. And uh, I pasted because they also publish uh, the, the Mandarin translation of the celebrated uh, How to Be an Investigative Journalist book, uh, so that they want their readers to become investigative journalists. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm hoping that maybe in a digital era, all those uh, um, qualified 
high quality investigative journalist um, can make a good network. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Yes, de definitely, right? definitely, and and I think they're also figuring out ways to work beyond this small uh, space. For example, um, they focus a lot on the podcast format, and on the podcast format, you're allowed to do long form uh, much more easily. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I do that too every month like, mm -hmm. uh, for sixteen minutes. Ah, okay. And, yeah, that that's like um, um, membership um, podcast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it's good for me, to, it's a good training for me to uh, keep quality because they're paying for me. Yes, right? definitely. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that that's, that I agree. And um, so in Taiwan, the people trust um, civic journalism, I mean, mm -hmm. civ um, civic sector information mm -hmm. more than just, let's say, from TV or from the government. Well, they trust it if they get to participate in it, or their neighbors, <laughs> then the, their friends and families participated in it, and and that's the 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 main promise of citizen science and civic mm -hmm. uh, technology, right? If you don't like it, well, come in and improve it. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't say it's everyone, but people who want to participate, they increasingly see that oh, they can also shape. Uh, the contributions the way they like and instead of just on a master narrative. So I think more and more people uh, are looking at citizen science and civic uh, infrastructure as a way to to correct the, the injustices they see and so on. We've got a lot of people, for example, measuring air quality like PM 2.5 on their schools, on their balconies and so on. And that culminated in the uh, anti-air pollution parade and that uh, really changed the environmental policy in Taiwan or people uh, using water boxes to measure water quality and pollutions using uh, their own way to analyze uh, the uh, industrial plants uh, the efforts um, of uh, containing pollution whether it has worked or not on agricultural lands and that resulted in uh, a recent referendum uh, in Xinju uh, that uh, wants to uh, change the way that waterway works and so on so yeah, if you find there's some injustice, participatory um, journalism and civic technology are now seen as a legitimate way to effect change. Oh, that makes me so excited. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's very pretty way to look at it. Mm -hmm. And um, speaking of uh, pro being proactive in uh, digital democracy, um, what do you, you know, what role do you think that teachers can play for digital democracy? Because in Japan, there is an opinion that um, now the government is um, providing a tablet uh, to the elementary school. Uh, yeah, yes, I've heard. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. And then and um, one former politician says, oh, you know, it's going to be so effective and <clears throat> more efficient so that's going to eliminate the need for a live teacher okay uh so are, are they actually doing that i mean replacing books and teachers no they are um thinking about ah, okay. um replacing the public servant the number of public servant ah i see i see you know i mean uh -huh. in a way it's true but um i, I i'm not sure if like um digital textbook or mm. digital application, mm -hmm. learning application can replace yeah, and, and, and I think it's it's a difficult to to um, reason about because when you say replacement, people immediately think, oh oh, they're out of a job now, right? Uh, but but I, I think their job <coughs> is not just to read text to a student <laughs> or to evaluate uh, their homework, right? Most of the teacher's job is actually to care, uh, to to discover, uh, to learn together 
with the students, which is strictly speaking interpersonal work. Uh, it's not automatable. Uh, and so um, when we look at technology that are assistive, assistive technology, it means that it enhances the, the dignity and the effectiveness of interpersonal communication. For example, uh, this is a assistive technology. <laughs> I don't uh, see you very well without this technology, but I wouldn't say my eyeglass replace me or my eyes. That would not even make sense. <laughs> so, so, so to me, the digital technology like tablets are like this eyeglass. Uh, when I need it, I put it on. When I don't need it, I certainly don't wear it when I don't need it. And uh, uh, still, uh, I remain uh, the, the main initiator of the actions uh, instead of, uh, you know, looking at you for 10 seconds and then suddenly an advertisement comes and I have to wait for 10 seconds to close it to look yeah. at you again. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It must be transparent to me, aligned to my interest and accountable yeah. to me uh, too. And, and I uh, that's what we look at when we design our own uh, tablet in classroom uh, projects. We don't, for, for even a second, uh, imagine replacing teachers uh, with the tablets. Right. Oh, right, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's something um, many teachers in, in the US or Japan or Europe uh, worry that, you know, once you give the tablet to the student, it's very difficult to um, to stop them from looking at mm -hmm. all those SNS and Netflix and YouTube. Uh, and it's actually very easy uh, to <laughs> to yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, um, so um, I think one of the main ideas is that the tablets are there for the classroom's use. So mm -hmm. what it must uh, be saying uh, is uh, it only runs the applications that are collaboratively curated by the classroom. Of course, if a student writes an application that helps the class, uh, the okay. tablet can run it, of course. Mm -hmm. It's a programming environment. But it must not run things uh, that are, um, for example, <clears throat> um, you, you mentioned uh, like uh, Facebook or Twitter. It must not run Facebook or Twitter during class uh, any more than uh, a student is allowed to bring uh, hard liquor uh, <laughs> during class and start <laughs> drinking it. Right? It's not a restriction of freedom per se. It's uh, the space's own norms uh, in using people's um, like focus attention on a common matter. So in Taiwan, uh, if a class decides to use a tablet and it's not mandatory if they collaboratively decide then they also must collaboratively curate the list of application that runs in a particular classroom mm. so so the, so again the there's a choice mm -hmm. it's not a mandate yeah, that's right, right? Mm -hmm. oh that's very important um our uh, digital minister just announced a couple couple of days ago she said uh, now the state, the government, is centralized all the data of children mm -hmm. um, through um, digital device, like digital education. Mm -hmm. And um, from hearing a story of Taiwan or your experience, um, <coughs> I'm not sure if uh, centralizing all information mm -hmm in the hand of the state is um, is safe mm -hmm. and I think it affects to uh, trust between the government and the citizen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I, I think uh, at least, of course, the, the student must have a full copy, right? So uh, instead of uh, centralizing being a single point of failure, you can't think of centralization as providing backups. That's the first, it's the kind of bottom line. Uh, and the second is the mutual accountability. What the state does with the data, is it just for statistics, which would be fine, or is it actually for personalized messages, which needs then uh, more attention to correct the data bias, or whether it's selling advertisement. I don't think your digital ministry is doing that, uh, but there needs to be a limit uh, to what the state is legally allowed to do and a way for mutual accountability for the citizen to hold the state to account. Oh, okay, so that, that's something we can do about it. Um, <clears throat> 
So um, let's go back to the education. Mm -hmm. And you said um, now in the digital era, we should teach um, medical competency mm. rather than medical literacy. Media, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, literacy. Uh -huh. um, how, how does how do you do that in Taiwan at school? Mm -hmm. like how, what, what kind of media competency? Uh, there, there are many things uh, that we do, uh, and uh, fortunately, it's all in a single website. So I'm just pasting you the website, uh, right? Uh, and uh, it's the Media Competence uh, Resource website, and uh, it has the educational resources, all the publications, uh, and also the so-called seed teachers, uh, so that you can also consult these people uh, and many contributions uh, from the social sector uh, in collaboration uh, with many uh, entertainment sectors, social media companies, and so on. So I would not read uh, what's on the website because it's all on the website, I believe it's it's friendly to machine translation. Okay, I'll take a look at it. Thank uh -huh. you. And <clears throat> um, you talked about your glasses and your body mm -hmm. before, and you know, like uh, virtual reality evolves right now, and you know, become more and more like extension of a body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what should we teach our children so that they do not lose the ability? To, to feel their body or to think by themselves. Because I think it's once we start thinking that that's extension of body, mm -hmm. that will affect our um, being proactive or think deeply or, you know. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, may, I may be um, thinking that or feeling that the eyeglass is part of my eyes now because I, I don't think about my eyeglass very much right? and and if I wear contact uh, lenses I, I feel it even less so so th there are certain pieces of technology that we do allow themselves to kind of blend in with our body image uh, and the society has largely accepted that uh, I, I don't think there is anything wrong really with thinking your eyeglass or <laughs> contact lenses as part of your eyes uh, during during day time so so I think mm -hmm. it must be talked and discussed in a case-by-case -case basis that is to say if a piece of technology is truly assistive meaning that it's 100% aligned to my interest and not some advertisers if it's 100% right. accountable in that if this uh, eyeglass is broken I get really to to fix it myself or take it to the repair person down the street I don't have to reverse engineer its algorithm I don't have to pay tens of millions of dollars or sign an NDA right I can just repair it right. myself right and when, and when technology goes to this degree of accountability and alignment I don't think there's a problem of thinking is part of our body I think the the, the problem stems from uh, essentially that uh, it's colonizing our body, right? Uh, forming an addictive behavior, but uh, with no control or indeed participation from me. If I uh, build an addiction to touch screen swiping and then looking at advertisement, impulse buying and so on, it's not me anymore, right? It's uh, me being colonized uh, by some external force, right? right? right. So, so right. I believe we need to let our children know that there are certain class of technologies that inherently have negative mental health uh, externalities, uh, builds addictive behavior that lets you become colonized easily. And we need to talk about this exactly as how we talk about smoking cigarettes uh, or drinking uh, liquor uh, to the children. That is to say, it's bad for your health. And it's bad for everybody else's health too if you overdo it uh, and which is why um, we encourage you to um, build healthier habits instead of relying on addictive substances uh, to comfort right. yourself and so on uh, and so we need to start talking about these but when they are adults and they decide to socialize a little bit and drink a little bit of sake and so on uh, I think that's their freedom <laughs> but they must yeah. be already in yeah. a mature uh, uh, sense of mind that they are drinking it uh, fully knowing its repercussions not over drinking it certainly not yeah. driving after drinking it uh, yeah. and uh, and then uh, of course they may use Twitter I guess or Facebook right 
Right. So that's the choice when it comes to adults. But um, I, I had uh, this discussion with this uh, professor the other day. Um, mm -hmm. He's a neuro uh, mm -hmm. professor, mm -hmm. um, professional mm -hmm. expert. And we were talking about um, letting like three years old swipe the smartphone mm -hmm. and and how it affects to, to, uh, to their brain. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah. And um, do you do anything like I, I try not to touch the, mm -hmm. the phone mm -hmm. uh, unless it's really necessary because I know it's very hard not to say, oh, you are, is this a mobile phone? Yeah, it's a mobile phone. It's 4G. It, it, run, <laughs> it runs. Twitter, if it must, uh, but it's not a touch screen. Oh. Yeah. So, so it's, it's like an like an old style mobile phone. Yeah, it's styled after a old style mobile phone, but it's actually a smartphone. Uh, so it's a smartphone without a touch screen, so to speak. And uh, in my other phone, which is a touch screen, I always use this uh, to interface with it. Oh. Right. So, oh. so it's either with a stylus or with no touch screen at all. You do it on purpose, right? I do it on you purpose. object between that and... Yeah, the because when I interact through a, a keyboard uh, like, like this, or okay. interact with the stylus, um, I am intentional. I must think about where I'm going. And so okay. it, it's not uh, habit forming, it's not swiping. Uh, but if I start just randomly swiping, then I lose control, right? So, and I don't think it's, it's just me. It's, it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know, I know. And, 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 and frankly speaking, I've never used a PDA without a stylus or keyboard. So, oh. so I use Palm Pilot, I used uh, Sharp Zoras, um, this is Galaxy Note, uh, and uh, uh, iPad with a app, uh, Apple Pencil. So yeah. always, with, always with a stylus, because when I find myself using something that has neither a keyboard or a stylus, I become addicted very quickly and I don't like that. You are? Uh -huh. <laughs> if you get addicted, that is within everybody mm -hmm. else. Well, I don't know about that, but, but what I'm saying is that uh, I uh, like I wear my mask, I wash my hands, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I don't believe in my superiority of antibodies uh, and so on. I, I don't believe in my inherent power to counter the virus. I'm as vulnerable to the coronavirus as everyone else. So, so that's why I t took the vaccine and washed my hands and wear my mask. That's right, right. That's so funny. Um, I heard that um, you dropped out of junior high school, right? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you had nothing more to learn, you thought. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to focus on research, but yes. Uh -huh. Right, right, right. Yeah, I read that. And uh -huh. But as an adult, uh, you've been working on um, educational reform, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. when you grow up, you go to your mm -hmm. government and mm -hmm. you actually mm -hmm. start updating mm -hmm. your curriculum yes based on my experience in the alternative or experimental education yes beautiful that's, mm -hmm. that's beautiful and what was the best uh, educational reform that you did mm -hmm. well i think uh, certainly uh, my contribution uh, during the basic education reform that uh, went into effect in 2019 uh, was making sure that everyone in the society knows what's going on when we redesigned the curriculum. I uh, mm -hmm. typed the transcript myself of all the curriculum committee meetings uh, for the first couple meetings I went to, and then I later on brought in uh, a professional court reporter, a stenographer, uh, to record everything. And it became then a new tradition so that uh, the curriculum review committee also has to <clears throat> kind of live cast or at least uh, post a transcript right before okay. every uh, meetings people get this uh, consent from all participants which includes uh, representative from the parents and so on I think on the review committee even the student representatives are also part of the conversation which is for the first time uh, in Taiwan's history so that <clears throat> when people look at the transcripts they know exactly what's going on. Previously, they only know what's going on when uh, already it's published and there's right. a protest and things like that. Uh, but uh, we were able, through radical transparency, to bring the people who would have protested on the end to the very beginning, uh, to the participate in the collaborative forming of the curriculum oh. of the agenda. And that tradition also informed the open government principles uh, in each school 
So each school are now inviting their students also, or their alums and so on, and their parents to the curriculum committee within the school to design their own classes and so on. Because one major part of the reform is that our senior highs are now structured like universities uh, with mm -hmm. the school defined uh, classes, with the optional classes uh, and things like that. And so they need the committee just like a university. Uh, and uh, uh, I think more participation in a transparent way so that people with very different positions can come to some general understanding and rough consensus. I made this uh, more procedural uh, contribution, not a substantial but procedural uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, rough consensus. That's, that's fascinating. So, so if you go back to 14 years old in mm -hmm. Taiwan today, mm -hmm. do you think you'd make the same choice? Mm -hmm. Leave mm -hmm. school? Yeah, so so yeah, the point is that I don't have to uh, make the choice anymore because it's now a uh, spectrum. A person oh. can go to experimental education and start telestudying or things like that uh, with the mm -hmm. full blessing of the system. Up to 10% of Taiwanese students can decide their own curriculum and they don't lose the rights uh, the way I lost my rights <laughs> to access the school facilities and things like that. When they do that, they, they, they are blessed, uh, they are pioneers, so to speak. And then uh, when they want to go back to the institutional system, they don't have to wait uh, for two years, take an exam or something, they just go back. Uh, and then they bring their alternate uh, curriculums and the lessons they learned. And they can also inform their school's uh, participatory committee on curriculum to start new classes and so on, uh, philosophy, esports, whatever, uh, within that school also. So there's a kind of zigzagging going on in all levels of basic education between the mm -hmm. experimental schools, more like research, and the institutional schools, more like development. Wow, I would love to go to that school. Mm -hmm, yeah, and, and it's <clears throat> now uh, the, the system, right? So previously, there's just a few schools practicing that. Uh, we mm -hmm. call them pilots, but now all the schools in Taiwan are doing this. Wow, that, that's wonderful. So it's like um, you can learn, you can keep on studying mm -hmm. all your life. That's, that's exactly right. Lifelong right. learning, we call it. Yeah. Wow, that, that's, that's great. Um, um, you you are uh, digital technology. You said uh, you always say digital technology frees us from um, constraints of time and space. Yes, and which is true. It, it saves time and everything, and and at the same time, I think it's very important to have a real space um, sharing experience with other people. Um, yes. You know, in, in real. Of course. And. Um, you when you um before COVID nineteen, you used to go around the country, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I still do. I still do. You still do? Yeah, I still do. Uh, I think this Saturday I'm going to Pingling uh, and so on because we we've never had a lockdown, right? Um, oh, that's right. You're free from lockdown. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 don't, we didn't have a lockdown. So uh, what, what I was saying is that I'm, I'm a telecommuting minister. So like um, I don't have to go to the cabinet office every day. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, I'm not in the cabinet office now. Uh, and then I only go to the cabinet office uh, on Mondays and Thursdays. So the other days I'm free to telecommute anywhere uh, in Taiwan or in the world. And uh, that has been like that well before the COVID uh, pandemic. So uh, the pandemic in a sense uh, made everyone uh, feel how it's like uh, to telework, uh, but I've been teleworking uh, since before the pandemic. So, so what are the benefits of meeting mm -hmm. people in person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the main benefit is that we build a mental model of the nonverbal expressions of the other persons so that when we later go back online, we can accurately reconstruct what they're trying to say. Right. Uh, and, and for example, we're, we're doing uh, now our conversation in together mode, uh, which is already much better right, than a lot of small squares. Uh, but still, um, yeah. <laughs> right. 
natural. Right, right, right. It's, it's. I mean, I can't just look at you like this. <laughs> so, so it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's more uh, natural this way. It's in a setting that doesn't alienate ourselves because we then share the ambience, the surroundings. Uh, and it's important because otherwise we lose the sense of nonverbal gestures and nonverbal conversations and the nonverbal uh, part of our communication. But still, uh, it's a approximation only, right? We only see, uh, you know, a selected parts <laughs> of, our, yeah. of each other. Uh, but but still, it's it's something. But what I'm trying to say is that the more immersive the experience is, the easier would it be to build the nonverbal communication model in our own minds. Uh, and then it will feel more relational, less transactional. And then it's much likely that when we then uh, have another communication, another communication, uh, we will be actually getting uh, the nonverbal signals better from each other. Uh, but uh, that is to say it will converge to mutual understanding. But if you only had limited bandwidth, uh, not a very good microphone and just small squares and so on, uh, then actually may diverge. Uh, so that um, my intention was not that, but you may psychologically project something into that, and then there's more misunderstanding and so on, and, and maybe it does not converge at all uh, after mm. a few rounds of conversation. The miscommunication risk is much higher, and even if we arrive at a convergent communication, it takes much longer. So I think face-to-face -face is just a more high bandwidth way to build mm. the nonverbal part as a ground of more conversations in the future. The foundation and then digital. Yes, oh, yeah. yes, oh. that's exactly right. Yeah, even with the mask, it's very difficult to read the people. I know, I know. Right? Definitely, which is why some have taken to wear a mask but with transparent uh, uh, plastic right? in, the, <laughs> in the mouth, <laughs> which looks a bit that funny, one. but at least you can uh, make out a, a smile, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was a good invention. Okay. Um, so my, my um, we are running out of time. So mm -hmm. my last question is like, what makes you so optimistic? Mm -hmm. Not only about digital technology, but also about the future of humanity. That that's my impression. yeah. Um, I think fundamentally that is because um, when I quit high school, mm -hmm. it's not traumatic. It's with a full blessing of the head of the school of our principal. So I thought, oh, career public servants are actually the most innovative. She even helped convincing my parents. So I feel blessed uh, and not excluded by the institution, which is why I believe uh, reforms are worth it, because uh, I do believe there are serious um, interest in reforms within the bureaucracy if you work with the bureaucrats as a person <laughs> as a citizen as a fellow citizen uh, not just as a role uh, and, and so on so that's the first thing and then when i dropped out uh, i had a lot of uh, reading right with the <clears throat> gutenberg project uh, mm -hmm. with people digitalizing the books that were free of copyright into the commons and that became kind of my, um, the ground, right, of my intellectual reading. But the thing is that in 1996, uh, I think the Gutenberg Project are only uh, allowed to carry the books that were written before the First World War, because everything after the First World War was still within copyright uh, uh -huh. at that time. And spe specifically, I think everything uh, around the Second World War uh, is, is still uh, universally within copyright. So I simply didn't read those. So um, my, my, so that the ground of my reading uh, was uh, rooted in an age where the world have not experienced a world war. Uh, and everyone was more optimistic back then. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that also informed my 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 um, upbringing, uh, my build on, so to speak. Uh, and then finally, the third, uh, my first uh, exercise in voting, like paper ballot voting, when I just turned 
2020, I went back to uh, my district uh, and elected the the Li Zhang, the the local um, leader, the local chief, uh, and uh, the borough. I think uh, that's the translation. Uh, and I, I voted. I specifically came back from the heart of Taipei City, back to where I uh, w was uh, raised in, and then voted. And then the person I voted won by one vote. So oh, no. <laughs> it's true. It, it's really true. <laughs> and and so I felt, wow, democracy really mattered. <laughs> and all the efforts I made in voting actually mattered. Uh, so 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 yeah, I think it's these personal experiences that made me very optimistic that individuals' choices mattered, that open access mattered, uh, <laughs> that the innovation within bureaucracy is possible. Oh, it's all foundations uh, mm -hmm. there and. Yeah, that's that's very encouraging, and I, I love your spirit, mm -hmm. very, and and I love your spirit, and then um, you make me think that uh, democracy is some. Um, it's like an application you can always update. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's high maintenance, but it's worth. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, and everyone can uh, design their own ways of participating in democracy and share it. So uh, it's not just a few elites uh, like the lawmakers. Everyone gets to be a lawmaker when you participate in democracy. That, that's really exciting. Thank you. And yeah, and mm -hmm. I'd love to um, come to Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah. I, I will, definitely, this year, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh seeing you in person yeah definitely so we can build more number about communication i'm sure uh, <laughs> so so you'll be uh writing about this right but not the video you will not post the video um i thought you are posting a video on uh, no it's a choice yeah. we always offer a choice. Oh, a choice so if you if you post a video yeah. we always do but if you don't uh we post just the transcript and we get to edit it together oh okay uh -huh. um if possible i i would love to post it on um my own too uh, you mean a video or a transcript or both both uh, both okay excellent so i will send you the video <clears throat> and we'll also post it to youtube uh, and uh, under Creative Commons uh, with, with your blessing. Uh, but I only have my local recording of my own face. Uh, so I, I think the Skype uh, will probably have uh, a, a video of us together. Uh, and I mean, it depends uh, which one you want to post, uh, but I'm uh, okay if you post either this one or that one, both are okay. Like this one, like we next to each other? No, I think uh, when we finish this conversation, Skype will probably still uh, produce the, the two box squares <laughs> uh, version. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I've not uh, looked at the Skype's functionality, so we'll figure out. But what I'm saying okay. is that I also have a video with just my own image. And, and that's what I plan to post because I didn't ask for your permission first. Uh, but if you want to use the Skype recorded video with both of our image, feel free. Please feel free to do so. Oh, yes. Thank uh -huh. you. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to. Excellent.